The silverware on display at Anfield is the most vivid proof of the domestic and European success of Liverpool Football Club. And one man has delivered more trophies than any other. Tactically, he was fantastic. Bob took the job and, well, the rest is history. There wasn't anything about football, whether it was on an injury side or a footballing side, that he didn't know. He would look at any player from the opposition and he would, he would spot weakness. The best judge of a football player um, that I've known. One of the best managers ever in the history of the game. In 1974, Liverpool were on the rise, but suddenly an FA Cup win would mark the end of an era. Many observers thought Bill Shankly was irreplaceable, but his successor was close to home. Quiet and unassuming, Bob Paisley was very different to his predecessor. The very definition of a reluctant hero. Bill had recommended Bob to take over, but Bob, A, didn't want the job. Uh, and it was also classed as Mission Impossible. Who could possibly follow Bill Shankly? It was the family we got behind him. We said, you, we know we could see what he could do, and we said, you can do it. It was that big of a shock, uh, but there had been like most people from the northeast, I had to work somewhere, and uh, that was the only job that was available. <laughs> Born in County Durham in 1919, Bob Paisley's football talent ensured his escape from a life working in the coal mines. Signed by amateur side Bishop Auckland in 1937, where he won the Amateur Cup two years later, Paisley moved to Liverpool in 1939. But the outbreak of World War II meant a wait of seven years before making his debut. In his first full season for the club, he helped them to their first league championship in 24 years. But three years later, came a setback which would shape his entire management career. He scored one of the goals that took Liverpool to the 1950 FA Cup final, but he was dropped for the final. And he said that really taught him a lesson. Paisley eventually retired in 1954 and joined Liverpool's backroom staff. By this time, he was renowned throughout the country for his skills as a physiotherapist. Sportsmen far and wide came to be treated. John Conte, the boxer, for example, athletes, dancers. And one lovely story, one Sunday morning, Bob's in the boot room and uh, the steward knocks at the door and said, Mr. Paisley, aye, he said, uh, there's a lady at the, uh, in reception with a dog. He said, lady, so he goes, and he said, can I help you? And the woman has this greyhound. He said, oh, Mr. Paisley, aye. She said, could you have a look at my dog? It's got a sore paw. <laughs> he said, I don't do dogs. Paisley moved through the ranks, eventually becoming Bill Shankly's right-hand man. It was a perfect double act. But in 1974, Shankly's retirement brought Paisley to the front line. All I wanted to do, though, at the end of the day, was to check on the staff, see their reaction and... Uh, you know, because you don't want to be battling against them or anything, and uh, they were all, you know, foes and that. Bill Shankly was the extrovert and Bob was the, the introvert, if you like, and so they blended, you know, really well. So, from my point of view, uh, it didn't change an awful lot, tactics, the way, you know, Bob slotted players in. He could mould, you know, them as a team, and uh, that was a, you know, fantastic thing that the, the both of them had. He certainly couldn't communicate with the press and even with the players as much as Shanks. But we knew him and we knew how good and how well he actually knew football. There wasn't anything about football, whether it was on an injury side or a footballing side, that he didn't know. So we were confident that things would just carry on. We're all sort of looking at each other thinking, well, how's he going to deal with us all, you know? And he came in and quite simply said, he said, look, lads, you know, Shanks has gone, uh, none of us wanted that, certainly I didn't want it, um, but he has and somebody's got to take 
this club on. Um, and he said, I'm the one that's going to do it. But he said, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to change anything. We're going to continue doing exactly what Shanks would have wanted us to do. I know we're going to try and do it better. An early sign of Paisley's management skill was his handling of Ray Kennedy. Bill Shankly's final signing was a striker, but Paisley saw potential elsewhere. It proved to be the first of many masterstrokes. Bob had this thing about him being a midfield player for some reason. And Bob even tracked down his schoolmaster in the northeast and said, can you tell me about the Kennedy fellow? He said, oh yeah, at school he said he played in midfield. Bob said, right. And he became outstanding for us, scored, you know, 10 or 12 goals a season for us from midfield. I mean, he was just a, a fantastic left-sided player. And every foreign coach Liverpool came up against, the first question they asked, is Ray Kennedy playing? They were frightened to death of it. Paisley's first season in charge was trophyless, but that was rectified in some style in 1976. Liverpool secured their ninth league title and a second UEFA Cup against Belgian side FC Bruges. The home game was pretty comfortable, I thought. The away game, um, we needed the Kevin Keegan equaliser to, uh, to get the result in Bruges, but Bruges, um, I didn't think, were the best side in the world, I have to say, and um, um, I think it was a game that we would have expected to win, and we did win quite comfortably in the end. The following season saw Paisley lead the club to even greater heights. The league was won comfortably, but Liverpool lost the FA Cup final to Manchester United. There was no time to dwell on the defeat. Just four days later came the biggest match in the club's history. Their first European Cup final in Rome against Borussia Mönchengladbach. Everybody was so excited. This was a culmination of everything what Shanks, what Bob and the board had all worked for. And you just knew on the day, once you've seen that, that embankment of fans at the far end, there's no way we're going to lose this game. We were told that 11,000 fans were going to travel to Rome, and we got there, and there was 26,000 fans that had travelled from all parts of the world to be there at Liverpool's first European Cup final. Bob called it my perfect day. The weather was good, the fans were impeccable, the opposition was quite testing. It helped to liberate Rome in the Second World War and he'd come back to Rome and <laughs> one of his team talk phrases in the dressing room was I beat the Germans on the back of a tank, now you go and do it on the field. Liverpool were superb, winning 3-1. They became only the second English club to be crowned champions of Europe. The way Liverpool played that night was fantastic and uh, it showed you how far they'd developed from the team Shanks had left behind in 74. Three years later, there was this fantastic team, much more sophisticated than the one Shanks had left. We went to the Holiday in St Peter's afterwards, after this wonderful win, and Bob is sitting in a cardigan drinking orange juice. He said, I'm saving every minute of this. And he did, he drank orange juice. And all around him they were having falling off tables, champagne poured out of window, everything going off. And there was Bob, sitting in his cardigan, sipping orange juice. That was something special, but uh, uh, I wasn't begrudging them, but I wanted to have all my faculties about it and, and, and remember the you know, the day and <laughs> what had been done. Well, we came home, we had a cup of tea and we went to bed. I mean, he was thrilled to bits inside him, but he wasn't talking a lot about it. No, he never did. If Liverpool were at the top of the tree in England, Paisley soon faced another challenge. Star player Kevin Keegan left the club to join German side Hamburg. We wondered um, how the clever Bob Paisley would replace him. Well, in fact, he replaced him with a different type of player. Liverpool were looking for someone else, and, and Bob Paisley thankfully came in and decided he wanted me. And uh, as I say, Kevin was fantastic for Liverpool Football Club, but he moved on, and uh, I was asked to, to move in. 
Uh, along with other players that he was to introduce, Bob wasn't fearful of breaking up a winning formula. Paisley had pulled off another masterstroke. For a British record fee of £440,000, Kenny Dalglish was signed from Celtic and became quite simply the greatest player ever to represent the club. He was a better player, you've got to say, that Kenny was, if anything, a better player than Kevin Keegan. Totally different kind of player, playing, Bob wanted him because he said, we've got a passing team and we want a player who's going to play in a passing team, and that was Kenny. Paisley brought in two more Scots to make up the new spine of his side, central defender Alan Hansen and midfielder Graham Souness. Bob Paisley would be the best judge of a football player um, that I've known. Um, not because he just picked me, but and Kenny Dalglish and Alan Hansen, but they know throughout his career as a manager, or throughout his career at Liverpool, you know, the players that he brought to Liverpool. Um, even before he became manager, he was responsible for you know, scouting players as well. He, he was a great judge of a football player. He would look at any player from the opposition and he would, he would spot a weakness. I remember it was about six weeks in at Liverpool, we were playing Chelsea. Dalglish is sitting next to me. He comes to Kenny and he says, I've been watching some tapes. Occasionally, the Chelsea goalkeeper strays a bit too far off his line. Six minutes into the match, it's played into Kenny's feet. He turns, he doesn't even look up, chips the goalkeeper, who's on the six-yard line. Everything he ever said was almost always right. And when you have that sort of knowledge, then that knowledge is respect. Souness, Dalglish and Hansen were instrumental in helping the club to a second successive European Cup final. In 1978 at Wembley, they faced FC Bruges of Belgium. Wembley was absolutely full of Liverpool fans. There was only small pockets of Bruges fans. And it was 1-0, but it was 1-0 going on 5 or 6. We absolutely battered them. The first time Kenny got through on his own from a lovely ball from Graham Souness, then he knew the goalkeeper would spread himself and he just dinked it over the top of him and made it look you know, ridiculously easy. To score one and lose none, then you're going to win it. And to get the trophy was, was fantastic for us, I think. Not for me, because I scored the goal, but for everything. The first British club to retain the European Cup. Fantastic, and of course, by then, Bob was recognised not just as the man who followed Shankly, but the greatest manager possibly Liverpool have ever had. Yeah, I thought I would be judged on Bill's standards, and if anybody goes into life and you're judged on, on his work and that, then, you know, nine times out of ten, you'll hit the... Bob Paisley had set his own standards, but not every decision was an immediate success. Alan Kennedy arrived from Newcastle in 1978 and made an inauspicious start. It was Queen's Park Rangers. We hadn't played that well, and to be fair, like I was the worst of the lot of them. I came into the dressing room and, and, and um, you know, and I could see Bob, like you know, looking at me. He said, "I think they shot the wrong Kennedy." The personnel changed. The principals did not. Bob made sure in my first few games that, you know, this, you're playing the Liverpool way, just, if you see a red shirt, just give it to them and, and just support. We all knew where we stood. We had this passing and movement way of doing things at Liverpool is, is never standing still. And we had that drummed into us throughout the week and Bob knew exactly how to get the best out of us. 1979 saw Liverpool win their 11th league championship, Paisley's third in four years. Along the way, they broke all records. 68 points, 85 goals scored, just 16 conceded. As a group of players, we were ultra confident. 78-79 was just sensation because we just went up and down the country, battering everybody into submission. A record number of points, record number of goals for, and a record number of goals against. And he came in and, this, and somebody said, who's played 13 league games stipulated to get a medal? Came in with a box and he started throwing the medals about. Like, you know, put your hands up and you get the medals. And then Paisley goes to the door and says, Yeah, 
Congratulations, you're a great team. Have a good summer. The hard work starts when we come back here on July the 12th. And that's what it was all about. You know, if there's one word that Paisley hated, it was the C word, complacency. I remember him talking to Stevie Highway one day where Stevie had a particular good game and everybody was praising him after the game and uh, Bob just came up behind him and whispered in his ear, he said, don't forget, Steve, a pat on the back is a very short distance from a kick up the backside. It didn't matter whether we'd won. 5-0 against Man United or we'd won 3-0 against Southampton or whatever. Come Monday morning, it was back to work. Forget about that. Next Saturday is, is the big game. Have you got any more ambitions left in this game? Yeah, win it next year. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Liverpool way, epitomised by their manager. Play, win, move on. Hello. Winning was everything. The medals were not important. Half the time you never knew where the medals were or anything else in the house. I still don't know where the thing was for the European Cup. Uh, I found a medal in the end, but the, they always got little trophies. Well, I've never found, never saw that. I never found that one. And, uh, no, the, he was p delighted with them. He was thrilled with them. But it was the actual material things, you know, that didn't worry him. <laughs> the thirst for glory was never quenched. The league title was won again in 1980, and the following season, Liverpool reached their third European Cup final. Paisley's philosophy was win the match, then worry about how you play. We knew it was all about winning, and second was nothing, and the fans understood that with us. You know, Real Madrid, we were playing, but it was a bigger game for Real Madrid than it was for Liverpool. As much as we were playing in the European Cup final, they were so up for it, wound up and everything, because they're playing the great Liverpool FC. We were bigger than them in world football. Liverpool ran out 1-0 winners, with the goal coming from a very unlikely source. In those positions, you get a bit of a rush of blood and you think to yourself, oh, just have a go. Being a Liverpool fan, being able to realise a dream and hold that cup aloft was just a, a sensational feeling. With that victory, Bob Paisley became the first manager to win three European Cups. Missing out on that 1950 FA Cup final had given Paisley a ruthless streak. Reputation meant nothing if it impacted on the team. As the man who lifted that European Cup found out just six months later. I just got called into his office and I thought, oh, oh what's this? And went in there and he took the captaincy off me. He said, because you're captain, you feel as though you're responsible. So I want to take that away from you. Maybe, hopefully, it will help your game. And I'll tell you what, we went on and I think we only lost one more game between then and the end of the season. We absolutely raced away with the league. So it had its impact and that's what man management is all about. Ian Rush became another example of Paisley's genius. The young striker had signed from Chester, but started poorly, afraid to be selfish in a team of stars. Paisley goaded the young Welshman, saying he was scared of the responsibility. Rush responded by scoring 30 goals as Liverpool claimed the league yet again in 1982. The partnership between the youthful Rush and the experienced Dalgleish was arguably the best the club had ever seen. His movement was brilliant. Uh, his pace. It was really sharp and it could finish anyway, right or left foot, even in the air. Well, I knew where he was going to put the ball and um, I think that gave us an advantage uh, over the, the midfield and the defence as well. And obviously because I had a bit of pace then I think um, suddenly I found myself, you know, three or four yards um, with one on one with the keeper. He educated himself really, really well and he's probably as good a finisher as what, what you've seen, but no, just a finisher. A centre forward. Just as he did with many of his players, Paisley instinctively knew when to call time on his own career. He announced that he would retire at the end of the 1982-83 season, but not before Liverpool returned to Wembley for a third consecutive League Cup final. Manchester United were beaten 2-1 in Paisley's last major final. And in a fitting tribute, his players, led by Graham Souness, insisted Bob collected the trophy himself.
Graham Sinners was, was brilliant in what he did there and say to him, listen, you know, we've done it for you. It, without you, we wouldn't be here. And that was, that was a great tribute from Graham to say to uh, Bob, you know, thanks very much for all you've done for us. You know, we'll never forget what you've done. May the 7th, 1983, was Bob Paisley's final game at Anfield. Thank you, and fans, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're making this harder than it uh, really should be. Uh, someone just asked me before if, you know, how I felt <coughs> on my last home game, and I thought, uh, it, it really hasn't dawned on me yet, but... Uh, when I think around the managerial world, there'll be quite a few that won't know they're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Fittingly, Paisley's final act as manager was to pick up yet more silverware. His sixth league title and 20th trophy in only nine years. A phenomenal achievement. What a record. What a blinking record. It's a hard act to follow. God bless him. God bless him. And happy retirement, lad. Happy retirement. Happy retirement. Bob Paisley had been at Anfield since 1939. The moment had finally come for Britain's most successful manager to leave the game behind. It was time now to spend precious moments with his family, not least wife Jessie, and their young grandchildren. The baby, yes, it's the baby, it is. Yes, Julie, can sit on me. Life has changed so all round. I mean, it, the state of affairs from when Bob and ten pound a week in the winter and eight pound in the summer and, and we thought we were doing quite nicely i mean the whole state of living for anybody has changed from then but for bob it's changed tremendously but those of us it made any difference really i was going to say those of us who don't know him obviously as well as you do would think that he's hardly changed at all as, as a bloke really in all know. those years you haven't have you yeah well, i still give the same <laughs> House keep money. <laughs> <laughs> 30 shillings. <laughs> in 1986, Kenny Dalgleish, now player manager, led Liverpool to the league and FA Cup double. Bob Paisley had taken an advisory role alongside the young Scott, yet throughout that season had remained largely in the background. But full time at Wembley saw the old stadium lit up by the smiles of the two men as the master and the pupil shared an emotional embrace. Paisley remained on the board at Liverpool until 1992, when ill health took its toll, forcing him to step down from the club he loved. Four years later, in 1996, aged 77, Bob Paisley died. After his death, the club unveiled the Paisley Gates outside the Cop, depicting his three European Cups, as well as the club crest and that of his birthplace, Hetton La Hole. Along with the Shankly Gates at the Anfield Road End, it's a fitting tribute to the two men who made Liverpool a European superpower. An unassuming legend, to this day, Bob Paisley remains one of the most successful managers of all time. You know, I remember again in that. European Cup final in Paris that you know we were staying in this wonderful hotel out in Versailles before the game and the chandeliers everywhere and everything about it is you know is real class and quality um, and Bob walking through the, the foyer on the morning of the European Cup final in his slippers with the Daily Mirror stuck out of his pocket you know it, it, that's the way he was. We loved playing for him you know because he, he he had a bit of a character and a bit of you know charisma about him like Whatever he said was, was it. That was the magical spell, to go on and win the European Cup for the first time, win all those trophies, 
year after year, winning the, winning the league title, it became second nature. And that was all down to Bob. And then but that's going out about 10 to 3. So Bill Shankly yeah, made Liverpool into a club universally known and respected, but Bob Paisley made them a great European power, the kings of the continent. In your way, why are these dreams you don't, you couldn't even think of what happened here. I, I joked about it when I took over, I said, you know, the, I only hope I'm here long enough to win as many trophies as Bill, and I thought then I'd be about 99. <laughs> <laughs>